For those of you who may be here for the first time, we've been going over a series of tough texts in Scripture. Four weeks ago, or three weeks ago, we looked at light in creation week. Day one, God created light. Day four, God created sun. How does that work? Two weeks ago, we looked at um, God hardening hearts. Troubling passage. Would God harden people's hearts just to destroy them? Seems strange. And last week, we looked at what was nailed to the cross in the book of Ephesians, what Paul was talking about. If any of these have resonated with you and you say, well, yeah, what's the deal with that? I invite you to go to our church website and listen to those presentations and uh, see what we, what we have to share from the Bible there on those topics. Today, I think, is no less interesting than any of those prior to this. Uh, you saw the sermon title on the board outside, Water into Wine. Some of you heard this last weekend, or at least a sermon with the same title don't think we're going to be quite the same, but hopefully it will be a blessing nonetheless. Let's bow our heads for prayer as we start. Father in heaven, we invite you to be here just now. I pray that you take my words and that you will choose them and they will be the words that need to be heard today. Thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. As physics professor at Adelaide University in Australia, Sir Kerr Grant used to illustrate the time of descent of a free-falling body by allowing a heavy ball suspended from the lecture theater roof trusses to fall some 30 feet and be caught in a sand bucket. Each year, the bucket was lined up meticulously to catch the ball, and each year, students secretly moved the bucket to the side so that the ball crashed thunderously onto the floor tiring of this rather stale joke, the professor traced a chalk line around the bucket. The students then moved the bucket as usual, traced a chalk mark around the new position, rubbed it out, and replaced the bucket in its original spot. Aha! The professor explained, seeing the faint outline of the erased chalk mark, he moved the bucket over and released the ball, which thundered to the floor as usual. Practical jokes are fun. Pranksters come up with all kinds of jokes to play on unsuspecting victims. Uh, A black-edged coin that you roll down your forehead. Uh, Loosening the lid on the salt shaker. Caramel onions instead of caramel apples. Short sheeting a bed. We could go on and on with appropriate and inappropriate pranks, but we won't this morning. Following these pranks, frequently you will hear hearty, sometimes uncontrollable laughter. I would imagine that some of you here this morning have played a trick or two in your day. Those on the receiving end of the joke, however, aren't always so excited. There are some good-humored folks and some who maybe not so much. What makes a joke so funny is the unsuspecting victim, their funny expression, or how they're completely confused about what just happened. Everyone else, however, completely understands, and they get some good belly laughing. From the account of Jesus' life, however, we don't see him as a prankster. We don't see Jesus playing any practical jokes. However, people many times were left surprised by his actions. Today's passage is one of these. Turn in your Bible with me to John chapter 2. John chapter 2, that's where we're going to spend the majority of our time today, looking at this story, Jesus' first miracle. We know according to the gospel record that Jesus went down to the Jordan River to be baptized by John. Following this, he was led out into the desert for 40 days, ministered to at the end of that time by the angels of heaven. Just in the days following this, Jesus uh, was out and about, and a couple of John's disciples heard John say of Jesus, Behold the Lamb of God. They picked up on it. They got it. And Andrew and Simon Peter said, Okay, John, we'll see you later. And off they went to follow Jesus. The next day, according to Scripture, Jesus called Philip 
to come and follow him. And Philip said, great, hang on just a second. And he ran home and got his brother Nathaniel. said, Nathaniel, we found the Messiah. And so then we pick up the story in John chapter 2, beginning in verse 1. On the third day, there was a wedding in Canaan of Galilee. And the mother of Jesus was there. Now both Jesus and his disciples were invited to the wedding. So Jesus was baptized, went out to the desert, came back, gained four disciples, and off he and his disciples went to this wedding gathering, this celebration, this new family that was created. They traveled back to the city of Canaan, just a small town about eight miles from Nazareth, Jesus' hometown. Jesus and his disciples had been invited to the wedding, wedding likely because they were actually relatives of the family that was getting married. We continue the story in verse 3. And when they ran out of wine, the mother of Jesus said to him, They have no wine. It would appear that Mary had helped to make the arrangements for this wedding. Maybe a little bit of a wedding planner, if you will. She was responsible for the details of the wedding to make sure it went off without a hitch. Everything was wonderful. And as they were going along, many times these festivals would be several days long, she recognized, "Uh uh-oh, we didn't plan well. We're running out of wine. We need something. And so who does she turn to? Her son, Jesus. He was such a respectful, such a helpful young boy. She turned to her son, a son who had come back from the wilderness changed. He was on a mission now. And Jesus replies to her in verse 4, Woman, what does your concern have to do with me? My hour has not come. And we read this and say, Jesus, how could you say such a thing? This is terrible. I, how many of you men will go to your wife and say, Hey, woman, I'm ready for supper. Yeah, okay, don't raise your hands. Don't raise your hands. I didn't think we'd have any takers. We consider that to be a very rude statement today. However, we have to understand in the Orient, this is not a rude response. This is actually a very respectful, dignified response that Jesus gives to his mother. We would expect no less. The God who said honor your father and your mother, would respond with respect and dignity. And indeed, Jesus does. Jesus says, leave me alone. It's not time yet. It's not time for my public ministry to begin. I'm not quite ready. You see, Jesus was in step with his father. And there was a timeline. There was a time and a place. And when it was time, Jesus had no problem moving forward with the mission. Jesus says to his mother, wait a second, it's not time. But apparently Mary missed it. You know, we're kind of hard-headed like that sometimes. Sometimes we miss what Jesus is telling us. And Mary goes on to say in verse 5, whatever he says, she says to the servants, whatever he says to you, do it. (laughs) Kind of putting Jesus on the spot, don't you think? Jesus is saying, no, it's not my time yet. And, And Mary says, hey guys, do whatever he says. Okay. John continues the description in verse 6. Now, there were set there six water pots of stone, according to the manner of purification of the Jews, containing 20 or 30 gallons apiece. So this was obviously a Jewish family. A a well-practiced Jewish family. They have the pots there for the ceremonial cleaning of hands as their guests would enter. So they have these pots here. Now, Now I don't know about you, but I have a couple um, planters on my back porch. Now, they're not stone. They're wood. They're still heavy. These were stone pots, not fake do stone like you find at Home Depot you can pick up with one finger. These are real stone pots, big enough to hold 20 to 30 gallons of water. Now, you know, you go to the grocery store and you get two gallons of milk and, you know, you don't want to walk all day with that. You try to get three and you get cramps in your fingers. Try 20 to 30. That's how large these pots are. These are big pots. Now, fortunately, Jesus didn't say, hey, throw it on your shoulder, walk across town, get some water and bring it back. I don't think they could have done it. That's heavy stuff. This is serious business. 20 to 30. So we're talking six pots at 20 to 30. We're talking 120 to 180 gallons of water. That's a lot. I don't know how big big the wedding gathering was, but that's a lot of water. And I don't imagine they went over the spigot and just turned it on and said, 
They had to go get that water somewhere. So they filled up those water pots as Jesus commanded. Oh yeah, not small water pots. Big things. We continue the story in verse 7. Jesus said to them, these are to the servants, fill the water pots with water. And what did they do? They filled them up just like Jesus said. And he said to them, draw some out now and take it to the master of the feast. And they belly ate. This is just water. What are you talking about? No. Scripture tells us they did it. They got the water and they took it to the master of the feast. So Jesus here takes control of the situation. He commands the water pots to be filled. He then says, dip some out, take it to the, to the head of household. Notice here in Scripture, there's no hocus pocus, no waving of a wand, not even a passing of his hand over the water pots. Jesus says, fill with water, take some to the head man. That was it. Nothing seems extraordinary about this process. Jesus says, fill the pots, take some to the master of the household. And we conclude the story in verse 9. When the master of the feast had tasted the water that was made wine, he did not know where it had come from. But the servants who had drawn the water knew. The master of the feast called the bridegroom. He said to him, Every man at the beginning sets out the good wine, and then when the guests have well drunk, then the inferior. You have kept the good wine until now. Master of the house says, Hey, something's going on. Joke's on me. Hey, guys, come on. The good stuff's supposed to come out first. Long enough to get people... Eh, relaxed, not quite as worried about the quality. Then the cheap stuff comes out to satisfy the tipsy guests. But this time something was different. This wasn't normal. The master of the house took a drink of the wine that Jesus made and something was wrong. This was not an inferior wine. Rather, this was a superior wine. The joke was on him. And so we ask the question, what did Jesus create at the wedding feast? A good place to start is with a principle that we find in Scripture. The principle of our Scripture reading today, 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 19 and 20. Do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God, and you are not your own? For you were bought at a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. So this does not answer our question. It doesn't answer our question of what, what Jesus created there at the wedding feast. But it does give us a principle. If our bodies are the temple of God, through the power of the indwelling Holy Spirit, how should we then take care of our bodies? Think for just a moment. If you bought a new car, how do you treat that car? Oh, yeah. You're going to wash that thing. You're going to make sure you you use top-grade fuel. You're going to have the treatments in it. You're going to get it waxed every other month. You're not going to be driving through the biggest mud hole you can find unless you got a pickup and you're just that way. Had somebody say that earlier. You're going to take care of that car. You're going to make sure, sometimes you may even take up two parking spots to make sure nobody's dinging your side of your car, right? You've seen those people. They take care of their vehicle. You're going to clean the inside. You're not going to let trash sit around. You're definitely not going to eat in the car. You're going to keep it mint. How about a new house? You have a new house. You just purchase. You watch the walls go up. You watch everything get done. Finally, everything's finished. You can move in. What are you going to do? You are going to be careful. Hey, right, watch that wall. Don't get too close to that chair. Hey, no kids. Uh, No, no, no. Crayons, put them away. They're not going to happen in my house. You're going to take care of your house, right? You're going to take care to make sure that house stays in great condition. Friends, your body is the temple of Almighty God. How should we treat that temple? If we treat a car well that will only last 20 or 30 years, maybe. If we treat a house well that may be 50 or 60 years, How much better should we treat the temple of God that can last forever? I suggest we need to treat it very carefully. We need to do the very best that we can to take care of our bodies. So how do we do this? Well, real quick, a principle you've heard before, New Start. You say, well, what's that? It's an acronym. 
Many of you have heard this before. Maybe some of you haven't. It's a very helpful way to think about health. How do we really take care of the temple that God has given us? Well, the end starts... uh, The end represents nutrition. Eating a healthy, balanced diet. Doctor in the house will agree with that. One of the most important things we can do, our body needs the nutrients and the foods around us. God has given us what we need to survive and to thrive. We need to have good nutrition. The E uh, stands for exercise. The W for water. I tell you, when I don't get enough exercise and water, I don't feel very good. Some of you may be able to relate. Some of you maybe don't know what really living is yet because you don't do enough of this. Exercise and water. You get energy. You sleep better at night. You think more clearly. These are principles of health to take care of the temple of our body. The S, sunshine. A good thing, hard to get when there's lots of smoke in the air. But we do the very best we can every once in a while. We get away to the mountains, get some sunshine. The T is temperance. Temperance is something none of us like. It's just the reality. I have a little um, gumball machine in my office, and it does not have gumballs in it. It has jelly beans. (laughs) And temperance is something I struggle with because, you see, that gumball machine runs out of jelly beans, and I don't have many guests in my office. (laughs) So you know where those jelly beans go. I enjoy them, but I struggle with temperance. I struggle to limit what I eat. Oh, I don't have lunch today. I'll just have another handful of jelly beans. And eventually I'll start to look like a jelly bean. (laughs) Temperance is so important. And it's not just food. Temperance is in all areas of our life. What we drink, how late we stay up, what we put into our bodies, what we put into our heads, what we put into our hearts. Temperance is an all-encompassing principle. The A start, stands for fresh air. Like I said, kind of hard to get in the valley when there's smoke sometimes. So every once in a while we have to disappear and get some fresh air out in the mountains. But hopefully we'll get some more fresh air coming around. It, air outside is still better than air inside. You just got to get that fresh air. R is rest. Now I know some people that operate on four hours of sleep a night. I don't think we were designed that way. I don't know how people can function that way. But I know when I don't get enough rest, like last night... I don't operate as well. I struggle to think clearly, to keep my emotions in check, to be able to have a positive countenance. We need good rest. And finally, T, trust in God. Stress is a huge killer. One of the best ways we can eliminate stress is by giving those things to God. Like our last song this morning, I surrender some things. I surrender all. We've got to give him all our burdens. And believe me, I'm not just, I'm not just preaching to you. <laughs> I'm preaching to me just as much. Because there's stuff I have to lay down. There's burdens I have to face. You see, I'm not so much different than any of you. Now, maybe my job is to stand up here and try to share with you from God's word, but I struggle with stuff in life just like you do. We all have to learn how to trust in God, how to surrender to Him the burdens that we face in life. But these are some principles, some health principles that we can use to the temple that God has given to us. Now this coming spring, there's a big game that comes up. It's the Super Bowl. And aside from the game on the field, why do we watch the Super Bowl? The commercials! So much fun! And we really only pay attention to the commercials unless Seattle's playing or something. Or whoever your favorite team is. But I remember as a kid watching the Super Bowl, not quite as interested about the game as the commercials. They were so funny. I remember three frogs on lily pads. Clydesdales playing football, kicking field goals. Dogs training Clydesdales to become the next great horse. Unfortunately, it seemed the best commercials were always beer commercials. Those in those ads, those drinking had no worries. They were laughing with great friends. They were having a terrific time. The commercials, however, did not show the lives that were ruined 
Young lives ended too soon. Loss of family and fortune when the addiction took over. They were a little bit biased in their presentation. Here's some interesting figures from both the National Institute on Alcohol Abuse and Alcoholism and the CDC. You may not have heard some of these statistics before. In 2006, there was an estimated $223.5 billion price tag on alcohol misuse problems. $223.5 billion in 2006. Excessive drinking led to approximately 88,000 deaths. Listen to this next one. 2.5 million years of potential life was lost each year between 2006 and 2010. 2.5 million years of potential life gone. Staggering. In 2013, nearly three out of every four people surveyed said they drank in the last year and one out of two in the last month. In 2013, there were over 10,000 deaths as a result of alcohol-impaired driving. Globally, alcohol misuse is the fifth leading cause of premature death. And when we scale that back to the age frame of 15 years to 49 years of age, it is the number one global killer. In addition to these statistics, there's many health risks. Short term, there's injury, violence, poisoning, miscarriage, stillbirth. Long term, we face high blood pressure, heart disease, stroke, digestive problems, anxiety, depression, social problems, cancers of the mouth, throat, esophagus, liver, colon, and breast. So why do I share this? To shame you? To scare you into abstinence from alcohol? No. No, these are simply the natural consequences of using a substance that God was, did not create for consumption. In case you feel like I'm just jumping on the church bandwagon of no drinking, no smoking, no drugs, let's look at a few examples from Scripture. What's a better place to look than the pages of Scripture, God's Word? There's a story about a guy by the name of Lot. Lot was Abraham's nephew. Abraham and, and Lot were blessed by God. Their families grew enormously. They, they were fruitful. And finally it came to the time where the land that they lived could not support their families any longer. They had to split up. They had to go their separate ways because there wasn't enough room. So Abraham said, Lot, you can go down to the valley. It's lush. There's water. Civilized. Everything's good down there. You can go to the mountains. You'll have to work hard. But there's not a lot of people. Lot said, I'll take the valley. Thank you very much. And off he went to the land of Sodom and Gomorrah. We know the story. An angel came and visited with Abraham and said, I'm going to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah unless there's some good people that I can find there. Well, turns out it was Lot and his family. And that was it, four of them. God said, hey, I'm going to destroy the city. You guys get out of town. So they turn, turn tail and run. Somewhere along the line, Lot's wife turned around and looked back. She just couldn't quite let go. And she was turned into a pillar of salt. We know that the next day that, that Lot and his girls showed up in Zor. And Lot said, I'm not sure that I can stay here. And so he took his girls and they went off to a cave somewhere outside of Zor. Well, some time passed and the girls realized, hey, wait a second. There's no guys around here. We're not going to have children. Our family's going to die here in this cave. This isn't good. We need to do something. Older daughter said, I got a plan. Let's get dad drunk. Their line was furthered through the use of alcohol. There's another guy in Scripture by the name of Noah, said to be a righteous man, blameless in his generation. He walked with God. After the flood, we're told that Noah was really good with the soil. He had a green thumb. I wish that that would have rubbed off on me. But he was really good with the soil and he planted a vineyard. It was fruitful. It was wonderful. And he, and he harvested the grapes and, and he enjoyed the product of his labor. Scripture tells us he went and got drunk. He drank a little too much that had been sitting around a little too long. Fell asleep naked. His son Ham comes by and says, Oh, Dad, what happened? He goes and tells his brothers. The outcome? He was cursed. It's true today that alcohol makes us do things we would not normally do because of the effect of the alcohol in the frontal lobe when drunk. We don't filter our actions well. Silly things happen. Our defenses are down. We just kind of do. 
Finally, we look at one more story, a guy by the name of Belshazzar. He was the grandson of Nebuchadnezzar. Belshazzar was ruling in Babylon while his father, Nabonidus, was recovering from illness. Belshazzar was a young man and he was proud. Hey, look at this. I'm in charge of the most powerful city in the world, the most powerful kingdom that rules the world. Look at me. And he brings all his nobles together, a thousand of them. And he puts on a party to shame all other parties. They get together, they start carousing, they start having some fun. Hey, this is good stuff. At some point, Belshazzar calls for the gold and silver goblets that his grandfather Nebuchadnezzar had taken out of the temple in Jerusalem. He said, hey, we need to use that stuff for our partying. Look at this. They were all getting quite drunk and then it happened. Bloodless hand appeared and wrote on the wall a message that Belshazzar was unable to understand. After interpretation from Daniel, Belshazzar lost his life to an invading army that night. And this because he defied the Lord of heaven and earth in his drunken stupor. The list goes on and on. But I think you get the point. So there's some example of bad things happening to people who got drunk. We know the physical effects of alcohol in the body. But what does the Bible actually say about wine? What does it say about strong drink? Surely the biblical text will tell us something to use. Well, there's a number of words for wine in the Bible. We're going to start with the Old Testament. We're not going to do an exhaustive list. You guys go to sleep on me. We don't want that happening. But I do want to look at a couple words. The most common word in Hebrew used for wine is the word yayin. Yayin. This is the most frequently used term out of the six we're going to look at briefly. This term, yayin, is used to talk about Noah in Genesis 9 and 12. This word was also used of the, uh, the wine used in sacrifice to God in Exodus 29. This word, yayin, is what was prohibited to Aaron and his sons when going into sacrifice in Leviticus 10. This yayin could be used by a Nazarite after his Nazarite vow in number 6. Proverbs 20 says that yayin is a mocker. And in Daniel 1, we find that yayin is the wine that Daniel would not drink to defile himself against God. So you say, okay, so what's the point? <laughs> so there's good and bad. So what is yayin? Well, that's kind of the point. Not sure. It's used in all kinds of different contexts. So we go to the next word, tirosh. Tirosh. This term for wine is used of that which is given to God. Genesis 27. This um, uh, tirosh is what cheers God and man in Judges chapter 9. It's also used of new wine in Jeremiah 31. So this term seems to be a very positive term. Something that, that is good before God. We go to our next term. Mishra. Mishra. This is what is used in the vow of the Nazarite in number 6, 3. The next word. Shakar. Shakar. This is interpreted, or translated rather, as intoxicating drink. It's what Eli accused Hannah of drinking. She comes to the temple and she's crying out before God, and Eli comes out and says, What's wrong with you, drunk woman? It's nine in the morning, quit your drinking. She says, No, 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 that's not it. Eli says, Shakar, intoxicating drink. In Ezra 7.22, we get the next word, Hamar. It's translated as something that is given as payment for work. It doesn't tell us anything about the term. In Proverbs 23, talking about mixed drink, it's um, mimsak. Mimsak. This is a, a very derogatory use of this term. So some of these terms are definitely negative, and some are nebulous. Some are positive. So this is what we see throughout the Old Testament. Now let's look briefly into the New Testament. The Greek term, uh, oinas. Oinos is the most commonly used term for wine in the New Testament. This term is used in our passage for today, John chapter 2. This is what Jesus creates, oinos. He made water into oinos, to wine. This is the same term that's used when Paul recommends Timothy to drink some wine in 1 Timothy 5. And I thought, okay, that's interesting. Let's see how the Greek writers who translated the Old Testament used oinos. Let's see what... Hebrew words they translated using oinos. This may give us a little better understanding of, of what the term means. And so the translators of the Septuagint, which is the Greek copy of the Old Testament, 
They use this term in the following instances. The story of Noah in Genesis 9. He got drunk. He drank oinos. The blessings of God in Genesis 27, oinos. When God talks about the vow of the Nazarite, number 6, oinos. It was used to describe what Hannah was accused of drinking by Eli in 1 Samuel 1, oinos. It was used to describe the wages given in Ezra 7. It was used to describe those who have woe and sorrow, contentions, complaints, wounds, and red eyes in Proverbs 23. Oinas is used across the board, good and bad, all the time. It's used to describe new wine in Isaiah 62. It's also used to describe the wine that Daniel would not defile himself with in Babylon in Daniel chapter 1. So this term, oinas, is no help. It doesn't give us any clarity as to what God provided, what Jesus made there at the wedding feast. Another term that's used in the New Testament is sekera. It's translated as strong drink or intoxicating drink. Definitely a negative connotation to this term. This word is only used once in the New Testament. That's in Luke 1.15 when the angel of the Lord is talking to Zacharias, the father of John the Baptist, and says you've got to keep him away from sekera. No intoxicating drink for John the Baptist. This term is used, however, in the Septuagint to explain the woes of Israel in Isaiah 28. It's also used to describe those who take the Nazarite vow should refrain from this, the sekera in Numbers 6.3. So this is definitely a negative term, has negative connotation. And finally, the last one, and I found this one kind of funny, and you medical people will understand, the last one is glucose. Glucose, all right, sugar. It's, it, it was, I had to read it twice when I looked it up. But this is uh, translated as sweet new wine in the process of fermenting. This word is used to accuse the disciples of intoxication on the day of Pentecost. Remember the Holy Spirit came down, tongues of fire, they went out, started speaking in multiple languages, and the people around said, wait a second, you guys are drunk! They said, no, 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 no. It's nine in the morning, we're not drunk. This is the Holy Spirit. Glucose. <clears throat> Many times the words that are used in Scripture will give us an indicator of what is meant. They'll give us more depth and understanding. However, based on the words used in both the Old Testament and the New Testament, we're not able to determine what Jesus created at the wedding on vocabulary alone. It's nebulous. It's up in the air. What did Jesus create? We're given principles, however, in Scripture that help us make an informed decision. Proverbs chapter one, uh, 20, rather, verse 1. Wine is a mocker. Strong drink is a brawler, and whoever is led astray by it is not wise. Yayin, oinas. Those are the terms. Proverbs 23, verse 29 through 30. Who has woe? Who has sorrow? Who has contentions? Who has complaints? Who has wounds without cause? Who has redness of eyes? Those who linger long at the wine. Those who go in search of mixed wine. And finally, Isaiah 5, 11. Woe to those who rise early in the morning, that they may follow intoxicating drink, who continue until night, till the wine inflames them. I could go on with passage after passage, but I don't need to do that. I think scripture is quite clear. Alcohol is not a good option for humanity. It will bring trouble to those who indulge in it for comfort. I don't believe this is the way we are to treat the temple of the Holy Spirit, God's temple. Since our bodies are the temple of the Holy Spirit, should we put things into our body that Scripture discourages? So today we've read the story of Jesus changing water into wine. We've asked the question, what did Jesus create? It's a question out there. We've looked at examples of characters in the Bible who got drunk and the consequences of those choices. We've looked at the physical realities as, uh, that result from alcohol. We've also looked at the terms used to describe wine and strong drink in Scripture. We've looked at the principles found in Scripture. So the question remains, did Jesus create intoxicating drink for the wedding in Cana? I believe we can apply the principles given to us in Scripture in regards to wine and strong drink, and we can conclude that Jesus did not produce something that would taint the ability of, the, of humanity to discern His presence or His desire for the well-being of His people, those who He would die for. He didn't want to see them make fools of themselves. 
He created pure, fresh grape juice that was the sweetest that people had ever tasted. You know, a couple weeks ago, I went to the refrigerator. I was thirsty. For some reason, I didn't go for the water. I went and looked in the refrigerator. And there I saw grape juice. I poured a glass. Oh, yeah, this is going to be great. And I took a sip. Oh, man. Oh, man, it made me pucker. It was so sweet. Oh, I finished that cup. I poured another one. Oh, man, there's nothing better when you're thirsty than a glass of fresh, cold grape juice. It was fantastic. I think that's what Jesus created there at Canaan. That's what Jesus created for celebration, for people to enjoy themselves with. That fresh juice of the wine, sweeter wine than had ever been tasted. And the man of the house says, wait a second. The second wine isn't worse than the first. It's a superior juice. It's a superior wine. And maybe there's somebody here today. Maybe there's somebody here today who likes to, likes to have a little bit of this stuff. Take the edge off the day. Help you relax. Try to get away from your struggles. Maybe you know it's hurting your relationships. You could see a wedge coming in between you and your partner, you and your spouse, you and your kids. Work isn't going as well. It doesn't seem to ease the, the struggles quite as much as it's supposed to. Maybe, maybe you know that it's something that you shouldn't be doing. You know it's not beneficial for you. Maybe you know it's something that you need to give up. If that's the case, I want to invite you to bow your heads with me just now. But you see, that's not the only struggle we have in this life. There's probably somebody else here today who struggles with temperance when it comes to food. Maybe sometimes you eat just to eat. Maybe you can't keep from snacking. Maybe that double cheeseburger dripping with grease is just up your alley. And maybe you recognize that you're not in the condition you used to be. Maybe you recognize that there's some things that need to change in your life. Maybe you don't feel as well as you used to. Maybe you're starting to look more like that Big Mac than anything else. Maybe you realize there's some changes you need to make and you need to make them quick because your health is deteriorating. Maybe you recognize that need today. Maybe today's the time to lay it down. If that's your challenge, I want to invite you to bow your heads with me. And there's still others here today. You work too much. 40 hours, 60 hours, 80 hours, it's nothing. You work all the time. You can see the challenges in your family. You and your wife are growing distant. Your kids don't respect you. You hardly see them anyway. Maybe you know there needs to be a change in your work patterns. You know that you need to put family first, not work, even though it seems like you've got to work to do all the fun things with the family that you never have time to do because you're working. But maybe your challenge is work. Maybe you need to lay that down this morning. Maybe you need God's help to put priorities straight. If that's you this morning, I want to invite you to bow your heads with me. Whatever your challenge is this morning, there's something that you need to give up. There's something you need to surrender. I want to invite you to do that this morning. God hears our prayers. God answers our prayers. Whatever it is that you're dealing with today, I want to invite you to bow your heads with me as we pray, Father in heaven. Lord Jesus, you love us more than anything. You came and died on the cross to pay our penalty. Lord, you, you told us that you're going to come and live in us through the power of your Holy Spirit. We are the temple of God, Lord Jesus. We want our temples to be clean this morning, but we recognize we can't do it on our own. We need your help. Jesus, I pray for each one this morning, whatever challenge is there, whether it's alcohol, eating, over, overworking, whatever the challenge is in each life this morning, Lord, we lay those burdens down at your feet. We ask that you will give us freedom from those burdens. We lay those things down at your feet just now. Lord Jesus, we ask that you take them. We ask that you give us the strength not to pick them up, but to leave them at your feet. Lord Jesus, help us to go from here lighthearted with a, a skip in our step because we know that you've taken care of the challenges and you will continue to walk with us and give us the strength to overcome those burdens 
that we so easily pick up. Lord Jesus, draw us close to you. Give us the strength to walk in the way that you want us to walk, to be the temple that you've designed us to be. Give us health, give us strength, give us energy, give us joy in the salvation that comes only from you. We love you, Lord. We thank you for your blessings. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.